Uh, okay. Thumbs up. Are we on? We're on. All right, Alan's on. All right, so here we go. We're in week three of our series, Friends. If you've been able to come to each week, awesome. If this is your first week, um, don't worry. We'll kind of give you an overview of week one and week two through our teaching. But before we get started, those of you who have been here and know what our youth vision statement, I want to hear it on three. One, two, three. To stretch the church and the church all to glorify God. And there's so much enthusiasm in this room, I can feel it. I can feel it on my skin. You guys are so excited to be at church tonight. I am too, okay? Um, our vision is to stretch the church, redeem the unchurched, all to glorify God. And uh, our purpose is not to just come here and have fun, but to come here and be stretched in our faith so that when we leave this place, we can reach out to people who don't know Jesus and help redeem them for God's glory, that our lives will be glorifying to Him in that process. All right, so if you've been here, you know that our series foundation text, you guys can find it in your notes if you guys want to follow along in your notes with us. Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character, okay? Most of us have probably heard our mom or dad tell us that, if you hang out with so-and-so, you're going to get in trouble. They're a bad influence. All right, your moms probably don't talk like that, okay? That's my impression of any female talking. You can ask my wife. She's like, talking like a lady, all right? So, um, so this is our series foundation that we're trying to get you guys to understand that there's choices that you guys can make between your friends and those that are going to encourage you and help you grow in your faith and those that are going to corrupt you and maybe some of the choices that you make along the way going through high school. Now week one we talked about what? Two types of friends. Anybody remember? Oh, uh, distracting and supportive. Cool. Alright. Supportive and distracting Louder. friends. Good job. Alright, and we gave two, two key points about it. Supportive friends work with you to help achieve what God has planned, and distractive friends work against you to help you fail at what God has planned. And we covered four chapters of the book of Nehemiah, and we covered that book real fast, kind of like tonight. This took me about a half an hour to draw, so that's why it's up here, and you guys aren't going to see me draw while I'm teaching tonight. But we covered four chapters, and we learned about friends that were supporting Nehemiah to help rebuild the walls. And then we learned about two guys in the story that were distracted people that were in his life trying to destroy his plan that God had put on his heart to rebuild the walls. All right, week two, we talked about what? Anybody? It was here last week? Wait, oh, real and two friends that do what? Oh, so take you. Break you down. Okay, build break you, you down. And build you up. Okay, build you up. All right, friends that put you down and build oh, you up. Well, good job. All right, yeah, yeah. we learned from James's teaching in James chapter 3 about how our words have power. And the foundational text that we had last week was that uh, our tongues have the power to bring life and death. That was our memory verse, if you guys got it this week. Um, we can either build people up in who they are. We can tell them that we believe in them. We think that they're awesome. We think that they're significant and that God's given them great talents and abilities and that they'll, they're will they going to change the world. Or we can tear people down by telling them that they suck, that they're horrible, that they're gay, that they're stupid, that they're whatever, and really make people feel lousy, insignificant, and worthless. And so our words have power in what we bring, and we said that hurtful words bring people down, and we talked about encouraging words build people up. Those are two two points. Now we're in week three, and we're going to talk about real friends versus two-faced friends. We all, if we sat here and we thought, we could probably think about at least one in each category. One that we know would stick through thick and thin, everything that we went through, they would always be there. And then there's that friend that is not always that way. It's kind of not very nice, and then sometimes they're super awesome, they're, they're your best friend, and then in other times they're like, yeah, I don't know, I don't really like you. Week four, we're going to talk about leading people, people who lead us to Jesus and people who lead us away from Jesus, all right? Now, this is going to be like a crazy, intense teaching, all right? So I need you guys to just put on your, like, major concentration caps 
caps because this is going to look really confusing, but I promise I tried to color coordinate as well as put letters in the heads so that the letters in the heads are the names of the people who we're going to talk about, all right? So here's our cast for tonight. We got Saul. Saul's in purple. Saul's going to, we're going to find out about him. He's the king, okay, in the story. We're going to learn about David. David's going to grow into the king position, so he's green, okay? Jonathan, he's a boy, so I mean I'm blue. And Michael, okay, Michael's a boy, or a girl in the story, okay, not a boy. And she's red, all right? Now, the scriptures don't tell us one's purple, one's green, one's blue, it's red. That's Graham's interpretation for this diagram, okay? Um, so we're going to cover a lot of material. Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16 through 20, roughly. Um, this starting point is actually going to start in chapters 10, 11 ish. Okay? Um, so know that I'm going to paraphrase and summarize like six chapters here as fast as I can so that we can get our teaching based on friends that are friends that are real and friends that are two faced. Okay? If you guys want to reread the scriptures, um, here it is. You guys can write it down in your notes. 1 Samuel 16 through 20. Okay, we're going to get started. All right, so the Israelites, they were upset. They were like, all of these other people have kings. What about us? Okay, the Israelites didn't have kings during this time. They had judges. They had prophets. They had all these people that were kind of the authority, but they didn't actually have a king that was over the people. And the Israelites saw all of these other countries and all these foreign people who had countries and authorities in, in front of them as their leadership. And so they thought, well, we need a king. And so they pleaded with um, Samuel, who was like the guy who was intervening between God and the people during that time. And so Samuel talked to God, and God was like, oh, these people don't get it, do they? All right. And so finally, God decided, all right, we're going to give them a king. So Samuel goes, and he finds this king. His name's Saul, okay? Saul gets anointed as king. You can see his little uh, birthday cake crown that I drew on top of him over here, all right? So Saul's king, okay? Now, Saul starts doing all of the things that kings do. God gives him direction, gives him things that he needs to do. He says, look, I need you to go and take over this land. And when you go into this land, you need to do this, this, and this. Okay? Those things included destroying the city, killing the people, killing the animals, and uh, taking everything that they have. And, and pretty much destroying everything. And so Saul goes into this town with these people, and they destroy it all. And then next thing you know, they're sparing the animals and they're sparing all sorts of other things. And he comes back and Samuel hears from God and God says, dude, your king, he already screwed up. All right. And so Samuel goes and talks to Saul and Saul's like, but I was just trying to bring this stuff here so that we could take it into the temple and offer it as an offering to God. So Saul's heart wasn't really necessarily bad in his plan because back then they offered animals for sacrifices to worship God. But God's plans and what God had asked Saul to do was not that. He asked Saul to destroy it all. And so Saul's disobedience is what kind of kicks off this whole story for us. And Saul's disobedience leads to David getting anointed. We all know the story about David and Goliath. We're going to get there shortly, okay? But in 1 Samuel chapter 16, David gets secretly anointed by Samuel. God tells Samuel, go and anoint this guy. He's going to be the next king. Saul doesn't know it yet, and he's just going to need to wait until Saul dies, and then he will take over um, as the king. And so David gets anointed, and he continues on his jobs of being the shepherd for his dad and taking care of the sheep and whatever else. And so the next thing you know, we move into 1 Samuel chapter 17 with David and Goliath. And and the Philistines are taunting the Israelites and they're saying, You're God stupid! We hate your God! You're an idiot! And you got this nine foot dude who's carrying a sword, and they got the scriptures say that there's a sword, a shield bearer. So you can imagine like how big this dude's shield was if it took a whole guy to hold a shield for this guy. And so David tells Saul, he says, Saul, I'm gonna go kill that dude. Okay? I my Lord is the Lord of the heavens armies, and I'm gonna go slay that giant. And so he goes with this little slingshot. You guys can see my imitation slingshot here, okay? And this is my giant, Goliath, all right? He's dead with his X'd out eyes, okay? He's laying on the ground. So David's doing some awesome things for King Saul, and King Saul decides, hey, David, I want you to be my BFF. All right, so this is David's best friend, okay? So Saul and David start being best friends. 
David moves in with Saul's family, and Saul starts anointing David as like the leader for different missions for the military and for the, the missions that they're going out to take over land and things like that. And so as this is happening, David begins to develop a relationship. This is where we're leading into 1 Samuel 18. Um, he starts developing a relationship with Saul's son, Jonathan. I put Three's Company. Um, you guys may not be old enough for Three's Company, okay? But uh, Three's Company. So you got Jonathan, David, and Saul. They're all buddies. They're hanging out. They're having a good time. And David keeps going on these missions and is very successful. Well, then, right in between Three's Company and Saul's jealousy, these people are starting to really believe in David. Okay, all of Saul's people that he leads are like, man, this David guy's amazing. He goes and he kills all these people, and they start making up these songs and these hymns about David. David kills ten thousand, and Saul kills only one thousand. And so you start seeing Saul's perspective of David changing, and it actually starts being disconnected. Okay, and so Saul's jealousy begins to get to him, and he starts feeling insecure about his throne and his leadership for the, the people and one time he actually tries to spear David okay that's what this long hole in his hand is if you're like what the heck is that stick in his hand All right so he tries to spear David so David and him aren't really good buddies anymore okay so then we move on a little farther into chapter 18 and Saul starts how do I take care of this guy you know I imagine he's like the creepy guy who's just sitting up there like like this he's like you guys ever seen The Simpsons? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alright. So, okay, so he's up there and he's thinking, he's like, how can I manage to get David killed without it really looking like I killed David? And so Saul's got this brilliant plan. I'm going to be best friends with David again. And so Saul says, hey, David, how about I give you my first daughter, alright? She's hot. She looks good, okay? I know you want, I know you want her, alright? And so he starts kind of offering, and, and they start building this friendship, and you can see sorry. Sorry, David. All right, so he apologizes and, and offers this first uh, daughter of his, and everything's going great. David's ready to marry this girl, and then next thing you know, Saul's like, just kidding. All right, Saul gives his first daughter away, but he doesn't give it to David. He gives it to some other dude, okay? So you kind of see this back and forth. He makes his promise, then he doesn't follow through with it. Well, three, three verses later, we're in chapter 18 still, and we're at, Saul makes another deal. Okay, Saul's still up there. He's thinking, how can I get this David guy killed? And I'm not responsible for it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell him that if he goes and leads these people to this battle, and they bring back 100 foreskins. It, I'm not going to explain what the foreskin is. If you haven't had sex <laughs> in, then I'm not going to go into it, okay? But it, David is told to go and kill these Philistine people and bring back this thing to Saul to show that he's killed him. But Saul's thinking in his head, he's like, all right, surely I'll answer after, okay? Surely he's thinking, he's like, if he really brings these back, I mean, there's no way he's going to do it. He's going to get killed. And so, but he says, if you do that for me, David, I'll give you my second born, Michael. She's hot too, all right? So David's kind of thinking, all right, I don't know if I can do this, okay? So Saul tells him that, goes on the story. David brings them back, says, here you go, Saul. This is what I've got. And so David gets to marry Saul's second, second uh, daughter, all right? So which brings us down here into the end of chapter 18 and start of chapter 19 and 20. I didn't draw out 19 and 20 because we'd be talking all night, all right? So David gets married to Michael, all right? There's a pretty part, okay? Oh, that's cute, okay? But Jonathan is still in the picture, okay? Jonathan is David's best friend, and he's always there beside taking care of David, telling David information. And Saul's real jealous now. Saul's real angry, and he said, all right, gloves are off. I'm not going to try to just kill this guy secretly. I'm going to do this thing publicly now. And so we enter into chapter 19. David starts finding out information from Jonathan that Saul is ready to kill him. And so David's wife says, here, let me lower you down in this basket outside this back wall because these people are going to come kill you tomorrow unless you want to stay here and die. And so 
the reason I drew all three of these in line here together is because this relationship and this bond between Jonathan's sister and David and Jonathan and David is a friendship that's real that we can actually understand. Because as we get farther along in the story, Jonathan starts telling David all of these secrets about Saul's plans to kill David. He starts telling him, this is when he's going to do it. This is what you need to do. This is where you need to go hide. Because if you don't, my father's going to send his army. You're going to be dead. And I don't want this to happen. And so in, in chapter 20, you really see this friendship between Jonathan and David. Really, you really see the closeness and the faithfulness and the, and the real, like, I'm not going to leave your side no matter what. And that takes us into our no scripture notes, okay? Um, friends that are two-faced. We're going to talk about those first. Friends that are two-faced may be insecure with themselves. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said? They credit David with 10,000 and me only with 1,000. Next, they'll be making their king, making him their king. And that was in Samuel 18, verse 8. All right, and the reason I put the scriptures in here so that you guys knew that I didn't just draw this thing up here to tell you a story, but it's actually in the text, so if you guys wanted to find out about how I found these applications. Sometimes friends that are two-faced are so insecure about themselves, they're willing to do whatever it takes to make you look worse, or willing to, to be friends in this moment, but not in this moment, because maybe maybe your friendship may may look them make them look better, or they may make you may look make them look worse. And so, depending on what it is, their security is kind of at stake. That friendship with them. All right. The second point is that friends that are two faced, they may make break promises. Okay, I told you guys about Saul offering David's wife, the first the firstborn first. Well. Guess what? That didn't happen. It, I mean, he said, oh, just kidding, I'm going to give this girl away to some other guy. And the text is there below. And how many of our friends that are that are two-faced that we may think about break promises? We, you know, we, they may promise us that they won't tell our secrets or, or, you know, we tell them something, confide in them because we really trust them, and then next thing you know, they're going and they're tweeting about it or they're, they're telling people at school about it. They're texting people about it. And it makes us feel that much lower because these friends that we've trusted, these friends that we've made promises with, are now breaking those promises. And then three, friends that are two-faced may plan destruction in your life. This whole time, even though on the surface, Saul looked like he was really trying to be friends with David by giving his daughters away in marriage. Deep down inside, he was really trying to plot David, David's death. He was trying to plot a way that David could be killed. He wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. Two-faced friends may be destructive in our lives. They may gossip about us. They may be friends with us in one circle of friends, but then when you go try to hang out with them in another setting, they may stand back away from you. They may say things to other people to make you look worse because they want to look better to a certain group or a certain crowd. They can care less about your reputation. They'd rather destroy it so that they, theirs looks better. And that's what two-faced friends will do to us. Now, on the other side, friends that are real, okay, our friends down here, Michael and Jonathan, these are friends that we need to look at in these stories so that we can be those real friends to our friends and that our friends that we hang out with, we know that they are real friends. We can test these things with it. Friends that are real will keep promises. Jonathan said way back here in the beginning of chapter 18, he said, look, David, I give you everything. He takes off his garments, he like his like war, like his war battle stuff, his swords and everything. He says, David, everything that I have, I'm giving it to you. I trust you. You're my best friend. I, I want you to know that you can trust me with anything. And he promises them that back here. Okay? We keep going along in the scriptures. He'll always be there. Jonathan did whatever he could in this story to be there for David. Even though his dad, Saul, 
was trying to kill his friend, he didn't do what his dad was asking or what his dad was wanting to do. He was doing what his friend was telling him. He was wanting to be a good friend and always be there for David. And then the third point, sorry, I'm behind here, getting ahead of myself. The third point is that the friends that are real will sacrifice everything. They'll give everything to be your friend. They'll give up whatever it may be. They'll give up time. They'll give up their money. They'll give the shirt off their back because they care about you that much. They'll give up everything that they have. And we can see that in 1 Samuel chapter 20. This is what, this is what uh, Jonathan tells David. But if my father is angry and wants you killed, may the Lord strike me and even kill me if I don't warn you so you can escape and live. May the Lord be with you as he is used as he used to be with my father. So Jonathan says, look, dude, if I don't tell you that my father's got evil plans for you, then may God kill me. He puts a curse on himself because he's saying, look, if I'm not going to be real with you, then God needs to, to take care of me. God needs to get rid of me because I'm not being a real friend to you. Those friends that are real will be there when you're down in the valley, when life sucks, when your grades are bad, when you're having family problems, when you're having boyfriend or girlfriend problems, those friends are going to be down in the valleys with you because they care about you and they want you to know that they're there to support you. And those friends are also going to be on those mountaintops with you, those experiences that you have where everything's great, the world is awesome, you're succeeding in what you're doing. Those friends.